What is urban DNA and why is it important? That's a very good question and a short question, but it's a very fundamental one, so we need a thorough answer here. Um, maybe I could take you on a trip uh, into history or maybe the time of the myths and the legions of the old Greek. And there was an old myth about a guy called Theseus. Maybe you heard about him. So he was young, adventurous. He went off to Crete. He fell in love. It's a very Hollywood story with a girl, car, a girl called Ariadna. And he killed there a beast called the Minotaur. Um, he broke up with the girl. He returned. He forgot that his father has asked to have a flag on top of the ship. So, a uh, big misunderstanding. The father jumped off a cliff in the sea, and that's the bird of the Aegean Sea. Why I'm saying this? Because there is a sentence in the book written by Plutarch that is actually a question. And the question is, can we call the ship of Plutarch still the ship of Plutarch, uh, of Theseus? Can we still call it the ship of Theseus? And why? Because every piece of wood in that ship was replaced by another piece of wood. We know the answer. We will say yes, because he's still the commander-in-chief there. So on a molecular, biological level, this ship is no longer the same ship. But the commander is still the same guy. Take that to the 21st century and let's do a thought experiment. And if your name is Jen, if I replace your hair, Jen, by synthetic hair, and I replace your eyes by head-up screens like the Terminator, and if I replace your limbs by bionicle uh, limbs like the, the women of six million dollar, and every body part of you is um, replaced by a synthetic one, are you still Jen? And the answer is again yes, because there is that, some people will call it soul, other people will call it conscious, um, that is related to you. And if we apply that to cities, you can strip all parts of a city and the assets and the events and the drums and so on, but there is still one part left and that's what we call the DNA. The DNA is the intrinsic character of a city. It's what helps us to understand the why of a city. A friend of mine, Dutch guy, called it with a French word terroir. Terroir is what people of the wine industry know. So if you replant your grapes, let's say, one mile further, it might not taste entirely the same because of these marginal differences, that these micro-elements. And is it important, the DNA of a city? Yes, it is important. And you know why? Because people in business, politicians, marketeers, can't do anything with a city if they don't respect the DNA. Take, for instance, marketing. How many campaigns do I see that are top-down, decided by a bunch of guys, and they say, this is what our city is about, without having any respect for the citizens and the DNA of the city? And they will fall down and will have no effect or result at all. And that's why it's so important. Uh, a place marketeer is not someone like a normal marketeer or a bad marketeer, because uh, an marketeer in fast consumer goods, he can say, this is a bunch of chips. We have a package, we have a test panel, we have research, and we say it will be a blue color, this baseline, we put it on the shelves in the supermarket, and after three weeks, it fails. You can't do that with a city, you can't reinvent a city. So you have to ask the chips what should be on the package, because they own it. It's about ownership as well, and it's about the DNA. Interesting. And so you have a nonprofit called Why Your City. Can you talk a bit about the inspiration behind that and what, what its goals are? The first initial inspiration was a kind of frustration. It was me in Toronto talking to a bunch of gray suits. They always start, if you make a marketing plan for a city, with economic drivers. Then they go on with KPIs, and in the end they say, yeah, and um, what are the, the, the values of this city? And they make the spider rep, and they say this, this, and this, and this. And that is wrong. You should really engage all your citizens in that. So that day, I remember, I ran on Queen Street, started to interview people. So, and I kept doing that while working in Canada, and later on in the United States. And I have a bunch of interviews, so what should I do with it? And my aim is, and it's a very modest thing, um, 
make people talk about cities. I'm a st strong believer in uh, grassroots movements, Jane Jacobs kind of thinking. Um, people should know that this is the most important thing in their life, that they will probably um, live the final stage of urbanization on this planet, which will be ended by 2060, according to the United Nations. And it's something people should talk about. It's about ownership. It's about DNA. And why is it non-profit? Because I, and that, that's my view, I don't want to earn money with data of other people. So that makes them f comfortable, at ease. And I'm now burning my own network and my family. And maybe because there is a soft launch, it just exists on Facebook and we should not uh, build on borrowed ground. Uh, we're going to make a website and bring it maybe to another level. Um, but it's not about me. It's not humans of New York or all these things. It's not an art project. And it's not a marketing thing. So it's not an open platform. Everybody can, every city can compete with each other. And you have these marketing. The final dream is having 10 years a world map with testimonials, honest testimonials, of people of the planet about the DNA of their city. And shifting gears to your day job, you focus on destination development. What are the biggest challenges facing us in that space right now? I'm glad that you didn't say destination marketing because the more and more I start to hate the word marketing, Seth Godin once wrote that maybe we should come up with another word. Um, instead of marketing something like market giving, I would suggest something with value, valuation, um, creating value for people, creating meaningfulness for people. Whatever destination development and the so-called DMO, the destination marketing organizations, I think there are two, three big challenges. The first one is about the planet uh, versus profit. Maybe you have seen the documentary, it's on YouTube, Goodbye Barcelona, about, it's from a Spanish professor. And it's all about what happens with mass tourism and how the population uh, will react on it. There are negative sentiments towards tourism growing throughout Europe. In Amsterdam, there are 700,000 people. They have 7 million tourists. That's one on 10. That's too much. There is no support among the citizens anymore. So destination development is the right word. It's about visitor management. It's, about, it's not about attracting as many tourists as uh, you think is good for your economy. And there's a big difference between Europe and our world in Canada and the United States. There it's about growth, sales, having more tourists in every marketing plan. But in Europe, which is much more compact, there is that conscious growing that should be done in a different way. And I'm wondering if the future is tourism about consumerism or should we come up with a new model where we do not regard people who travel as consumers, but more as guests. So I think we should come up with a word like hosting people, and, and, and it's in that way I'm thinking. And another thing that will happen in tourism is the clash between product and promotion. I am regarded as a specialist in brands, but I'm going to say that place brand is dying. I think it's all about UX. It's about the UX city. And there is really a big industry, especially in, in Europe, which is a red hot market with a lot of competition, a lot of tiny places, and they all want to have their unique brand. But in the end, it's about the experience that people have. So that's where visitor management is very important. And in the end, the best promotion will be, will be the quality of your product and your services. That's another thing that's going to happen. And the last thing, I think the role of destination developers will be changing dramatically. Now you have a DMO, a destination marketing organization, which executes a strategy of the cultural department and the politicians and the economic department. And I think there will be a need, so they won't disappear completely, but they will be upgraded and they will become the storytellers of a destination, the ghostwriters of a destination, they will, their role will not be promotional, but coordinating all those people, bringing them around, let them talk about a destination and let them decide together with their citizens, how are we going to sell our destination? Yeah. 
And kind of tangentially related to that, you have a talk about, well, you argue that there's no such thing as a smart city. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that and, and, and what that's all about? Yeah, it's a talk of five minutes, so I had to come <laughs> up with a sort of provocation. Um, of course, I'm a fan of smart cities. Um, but the thing is that, let's talk about data. Seth Godin wrote, um, data gets us the Kardashians, People become lazy and there are too many stakeholders that are cheering data, data, data. They don't have a clue what they're talking about. I have never met a politician who knows the difference between um, long data and big data and short data. Um, so what is worrisome is that we are building now sort of vendor lock-in places. For instance, New York, the council writes a letter to Google to ask in Google Maps, it's always that you, with your car, you go to the left. So that causes a lot of traffic jams. So if 30% in their map should go to the right, it would solve the problem. They didn't answer. And I don't know whether have they have answered already, but that's not the point. Is it normal that you have to ask a private company to solve a traffic uh, problem in a public space? So what we need actually is a sort of Jane Jacobs, again, a sort of grassroots activism online. And, and we have civil hackers and, 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 and that kind of people. I say there is no such thing as a smart city um, because I really believe that cities are for humankind, what the telephone booth is for Clark Kent, you know? He goes in and in a split of a second, he transforms in Superman. And we know that cities are the places where we could transform always um, our technology. So it's about technological disruption as well. And that's a very good thing. But bring these two big trends together. Um, on the one hand, you have um, the GNR, the genetics, the nanotechnology, the robotics, information technology. On the other hand, urbanization. 80% will live in cities in 2060. This is the most important thing we have to fix in our lives. What is wrong that, you know, in technology, these guys who are having presentations about the law of Moore and the law of Cooper and the law of Butters, and it's all about sublinear growth. It's about speeding up. It's about acceleration. What do we see on the social side? There is no acceleration at all. So what I am saying is, we used to have cities, we invented it. The old Greek, again, the old Greek invented it. And we created the polis with a direct democracy, really in your face. You could expel someone by voting, by putting a piece of a jar in a bowl and say, you have to go out. Minor detail, women and uh, foreigners were excluded from democracy in those days, but I'm sure Donald Trump wouldn't object. Um, what happened is that f 1500 years later, in Europe here, capitalism was there. Trade became more complex. There were new markets emerging. We call them colonies. And we needed to come up with a new model. And we created nations. And to make these nations work, we needed a representative democracy. So to bridge the gap between a citizen and the politician in the capital. And if that model was a bit worrisome and making some troubles, we created supranational institutions like the United Nations and the EU, and they are all stuck, aren't they? So what's happening now, we are on the end of, of, a, of a stage again, and in cities you still have now these emerging, you have now these emerging direct democr uh, democracy again. So we have to fix that link, we have to f uh, fix our democracy. Otherwise, we will have cities like disk operating systems, like Singapore or Songdo in South Korea. But that's like the Spartans that stop down. That's Big Brother. We need cities that are uh, networks, and that's the way to go, where you can share and collaborate together. I think that's my worry about smart cities. Um, yeah, I hope this is an answer. <laughs> Of course. And so how do you see that fitting in? There's this argument that we need to, to move to a more global world instead of having 
the, the individual nations and with the, the interconnectivity of the, the rising interconnectivity of everything. Yeah, absolutely. So it will be a sort of two-sided market. On the one hand, you will need to build really global institutions that work. And on the other hand, you will have to uh, decentralize and have more um, uh, local impact of people on decisions that are made for them. Interesting, okay. And so moving a little more broadly, what emerging areas of urban informatics do you uh, look at when you're reading papers and studies? And, and what do you read and what are you finding most compelling? Well, I started 10 years ago to read everything uh, Richard Florida, um, Charles Landry was all about the creative city, the smart city, the resilient city. The more I read about it, the more I get interested. I'm, I'm from, originally I'm a philosopher and I studied liter literature and philosophy before I studied marketing and management. And so there's a sort of funnel in me, it's always the why question that comes up. And now I'm very interested in people um, that go to um, the, the, the basic question um, about what is, is the foundation, the economic foundation of our city. And someone I, I really appreciate is, and he's not so known in the Anglo-Saxon world, but he's advising the Vatican and uh, the state of Ecuador is Michel Bowens uh, with his peer-to-peer -peer movement, um, where you really, really have sharing economy. Because Uber and Facebook in, are in my world and in my vision, they are not sharing economy. They create a win-win situation. There is something free for you and there is some money to earn with your data. But in the end, there is someone who always pays the bill. The same with tourism. Sometimes we create a win-win situation, but environment is destroyed, like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and tourists breaking up. So we need to create a win-win-win situation without any party losing anything. Um, that kind of disruption in economy and in politics is think very, I think is very necessary these days because we can't keep pace with what happens in technology. We can't keep pace with what happens in information technology. Are we going to, where is the politician that is really honest and says to people, your jobs will be destroyed? I don't see them on television. That's the only truth. So are we going to deal with that? So I'm more dragged into to that kind of thinking. And, and on the other hand, there are so much exciting um, experiments from urban farming and beehives on root, rooftops. Um, you, you have so weird things with nanotechnology. We, we can make um, artificial swarms that, that um, spread a shade on, on the city so that it's cooling down and so on. It's, it's for me really, the city is a testing um, environment. It's, it's, your, it's like when you do a test in a laboratorium, when your uh, setup is not right, everything will fail. So if the city is not right, I think everything will fail in the end. And to close on a more personal level, what people and projects are you following? What are you finding personally exciting these days? Oh, there is uh, so much I find exciting. You know, like everybody, I'm following the elections in the United States. And what really strikes me for the moment, nobody talks about cities. I had to present eight months ago in New Orleans. And I always wanted to go to New Orleans. And it's a great city because they, they really made something out of three cultures, the Spanish, the French, and the African culture, which is unique in that Anglo-Saxon bubble. But if you are in the French Quarter, it's full with tourists and, and boozing people, and you go one block away from that, that was really a shock for me. It's a disaster. And I don't speak, speak about the weeds on the, on the pavement and the traffic lights that don't work. I speak about people dying on the street. You see drug deals before your eyes. And I thought, where am I? Is this the United States? And now I'm, I'm looking into these programs from these politicians and they don't speak about cities. So if there is now a guy running for president and say, I will make American great again, I don't think so. I think there will be a mayor that will make American. It will be the mayors that will do that. There's, by the way, written a book by uh, Benjamin Barber. Maybe you heard about him. Uh, if, what if mayors would uh, rule the world, which is a very interesting book. 
the same kind of thinking. Well, interesting. Thank you very much for talking with me today. It's been fun.